Oh yeah, so uh, in this podcast, if you could tell me all about the Spanish economy, like as much as you know, like we could like talk as much as you possibly can about it, that would be very interesting. Why? Why Because Spain is one of the economies right now that are actually picking up, at least in the Mediterranean area. Yeah, yeah, because they they've taken a more specialized policy. Like now during the during the you know the recession and everything, people actually took to to getting educated. Um, yeah. In like very specific yeah. areas, you know, like uh, professional. Uh, education and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of even though there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, th there's a lot of you know dropouts and everything there is actually um, like most of the <coughs> students are specialized in in areas that you know are actually very you know are are picking up right now and that are becoming very important actually there is uh, a lot of uh, tech companies outsourcing their services to uh, No, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of tech companies picking outsourcing resources from from our from Spain. So you know they, they're they're getting becoming pretty big in tech things. Actually, there's a lot of um, a lot of Spanish people getting educated in the U.S. in things about big data and everything, and they're bringing it back to Spain. And so they're helping yeah. Europe, you know, like expand uh, their knowledge on big data and you know like picking up on these services as well. Okay, big so data, robotics. Uh, I want to stop you there. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, big data is a word that I hear a lot of students throwing around nowadays. Yeah. Do you, do you know about big data? I know about the big data, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I cannot say that I'm an expert at all, but, you know, if you major in finance, then... I kind of know about analytics uh, using big data, but that's pretty much it. Uh, in terms of, oh, you know, that like... That actually sounds exactly like a course that is pretty popular online among finance students. It's on Coursera, I think, or something like that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean... I haven't had it myself, but... Yeah. Hello, business people of the world. Today is Monday, June 19th, 2017, and welcome to Business Tribulations, where we talk about business and economic events. Today we will be discussing... The Greek Lifeline, we talk about how the IMF and the EU are giving a new loan to Greece. Esports, we talk about the increasing popularity of video game sport events. And Adam gives us a small crash course in financial markets. So let's start with uh, the Greek Lifeline. Um, on last Thursday, uh, the EU and the IMF have given uh, Greece a new loan. Um, after you know 11 hour credit lifeline on about of about 9.5 billion euros and they are also increasing the, um, the 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 amount of time they have to repay this loan for for from 15 years to 50 years so um matthias had some some interesting uh, uh things to say about this Yeah, well, so basically, <laughs> what do you want to hear, Alonso? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, well, we uh, we should we should uh, we should talk about how um why this is happening. Obviously, uh, we'll give give them a new explanation about why they need this this amount of money. Uh, this is um, this is obviously because of of the fact that they need to repay the old loans. So the IMF and the EU are giving them new loans so that they can repay the. The debtors, the debtors, or however exactly. you say that. Creditors. Creditors, yeah, sorry. And uh, I don't... So, obviously, the, 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 the economic, uh, the, the economic uh, you know, status of Greece is, uh, is actually a, a, a show, uh, something we will talk next week extensively. But today we will be talking about the, the reason behind this. And... Um, And a bit about you know the the Greek debt uh, that's that's uh, totaling uh, now in 2017 around 226.36 billion and they have a debt to GDP of 180 percent. So 
the greed crisis is not something that we will probably see any solution for in um, in a very long time. I don't know what you guys think about this. No, it's that's very correct. I mean, uh, since the crisis, the EU has promised a 86 billion euro bailout and uh, spread across a, a long period of time in order to basically secure Greece's uh, life for the next few years as a state and that uh, I think in the end that the euro doesn't fail yeah. as an idea and as a union so... and I think we've reached a point now where Greece defaulting would uh, put a whole EU into another gigantic crisis and uh, create really big turmoil because I, I think we touched it in the in the preparation real quick that uh, especially Germany um, if, if you guys have read the newspaper Schäuble and the uh, Greek Prime Minister or like the Greek uh, Ministry uh, is uh, are fallen out of uh, love <laughs> because Schäuble has been really tough on them as well yeah logical because Germany is one of, or if not the biggest uh, creditor in this in this uh, in this story. Yeah. So obviously the the Germans have to have a very tight grip on looking and controlling that first of all Greece is uh, adhering to all the reforms and that they're actually moving to a direction where where there will be you know uh, maybe some light at the end of the tunnel if I can put it like this. Well, that would be that would be obviously the best uh, the best the best outcome. Uh, for this situation, but I, I'd like to also know uh, about you know how how this affects the economy and uh, not just you know the Greek economy but the general economy because uh, if uh, if uh, if Greece fails then obviously the German Germany fails or you know Germany would would have a you know a, a big <coughs> financial problem obviously exactly. being a, a huge creditor of uh, of the Greek. Of the Greek uh, uh, of, of Greece, you know, and um, exactly. and this would affect obviously the the weaker all the weaker uh, economies in Europe, with uh, which is you know uh, uh, Italy and Ireland and Spain. So this would actually you know <laughs> be very bad for these countries, and exactly, it would be yeah. it would be a domino effect in the end, right? Because it would be uh you know it, these countries would go down then germany would go it would bring germany even deeper in in economic problems and this would obviously bring other countries into deeper economic problems so uh it's actually it's actually how how you know it's actually interesting to see how germany is uh is uh, the the not the weakest link but how if it gets affected economically very heavily then other countries would be also mm. affected I well, think there's you're... one thing that is kind of important to ask you, ask yourself here. Why? Because Germany is one of the the biggest. You know, they're saying that we should uphold the euro. Like they don't want. To, we're not going to see like you know any Jexit or German Xit or whatever you would call it. They're firmly standing behind the euro. But as you guys are saying, it seems to me like the euro. Like they're the one. They're the ones who's not really profiting from the euro at all. It seems like they're taking losses. So why are they standing so firmly behind the EU and well, the euro? Why well, do you guys think that? That's a very good question, but we have to look at this on a far bigger picture because we have really large economies nowadays that are competing against each other. And having the euro is actually giving us or giving the euro, whole eurozone a bigger power within within the whole uh, world economy giving us a stronger position having united all the european economies to one big one to one monetary market gives us or gives sorry germany and france and all the members supposedly bigger bargaining power looking at the us economy or china or russia so this especially would, this would actually... now this would put us in a in a weaker position against all these countries then, which wouldn't be very good like politically for for Europe, no? That is correct. And you know, we also have to look at Germany is the biggest economy of Europe. That's why they're also still driving this. And Germany has been since a few years now also like really the moving force, as you correctly said, Adam. 
Mm. And I, Angela Merkel is yeah, sorry. I'm actually I'm actually very interested to see what would happen. I, I mean, how would the Norwegian and Swedish economies be affected by a downfall of the EU? Not not like a downfall, but like a kind of like a small crisis due to the Greek you know, uh, default. No, but like you know, like especially like Sweden still has their own currency. So like we have to look there's like different things, you know, like if the eurozone fails or the euro fails as as a currency. Yeah. Um Obviously. I I don't know. Obviously. Sweden is going to be fine um if Greece fails and exactly. you know, like they're they're greatly affected by the eurozone obviously because Sweden exports to to mostly Germany, but you also have Norway, Denmark, and the UK. You know, like all these European countries. You know, the thing uh, but, is, I think Sweden, you know, would would even be okay if the euro plummets. You know, because like you're trading in crowns, so obviously that's yeah. okay. It would actually. Like, uh, it, all, it would be. It would be mm, good for actually, your. It would be good for your mm. for your uh, imports, but bad it, for your exports. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So it, it, it's so, actually in also your be best interest in Sweden to have a, a, a uh, that Europe has a strong economy or like a strong euro, more likely. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, or just a stable one, but a stable one, you know, a stable one. Yeah. What, what did you want to say, so, Adam? I want to circle back a bit to my original question that Matthias answered. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Matthias mostly, but... The answer didn't, in a way, make sense because, like, okay, so as we said, the euro is good at uniting all the European countries against the US and China and maybe Russia, maybe India as well. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> but does it does it matter? Like, do we need to unite against all these countries? Because as Alonso just said, a weak currency is a good currency. Or, or not. Why do we need to unite <laughs> against China and the US? Well, I mean, why is that kind of like, why, well, like, why, does, why does Germany need all these other European countries with them? I mean, like the whole EU is also like a free movement of people and goods. So it was actually an idea to like promote trade it, it amongst was... all countries. But yeah. look at look at Norway, look at the UK. They just exited uh, the European Union, and they're. Norway has been so fine without, you know, being in the European Union, and they're still but creating the housing. You guys are now na naming like really strong eco economies by themselves. Yeah, but you're you also know? in the Europe, Schengen. Europe is a very strong economy. You're also in the Schengen, uh, uh, aren't you, um, Adam? Sweden is in the Schengen uh, uh, thing. Uh, how do you call this uh, contract yeah. or whatever? So there's actually free movement of goods, even though there's uh, you still have your own economy. Uh, exactly. you, you're in the, the Schengen. Euro, yeah. the Schengen. Why yeah. do we? Why does Germany still stand so firmly behind the euro? That's the question that I want an answer to. Well, obviously because they're the ones having. Uh, they're all obviously the ones uh, exporting the most around Europe, especially um, luxury goods. Um, industrial goods, some industrial goods, and. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good answer, actually. So. Uh, if you unite with all the other currencies, then you know you might cause some, how do you say, uh, some uncertainties regarding the united currency, and yeah. this is going to cause an depreci depreciation, and the exports is going to increase. Uh, you know, I actually did my thesis paper on <clears throat> on how currency exchange rates uh, affects the the cash flow of public companies, specifically in Sweden. And I actually got the reverse results, which was kind of weird, but that's another topic by itself. Yeah. So yeah, but you know, that's a legit answer. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so they can actually, but you know, that's kind of weird as well. Would a country really do that? You know, unite with other countries, so their currency is not that strong anymore? Yes and no, because in a, in a, so in, in a certain way you get some stability. So when you're moving things within that Eurozone, you get stability in 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 sell, and you know that when you're selling uh, something, even if the euro goes down, you're still gonna sell it at the same price within that eurozone, in a kind of way. No, but it no? is a very yeah. intelligent move for for Germany to stay in it, and you're completely right. 
and we spoke about it many times actually that uh, me and my dad actually that uh, Germany's euro like if they had the currency by themselves it would be worth so much more but knowing that they are the strongest ones and that actually but, you is the Europe is not that strong by themselves but why having are they... a lower currency can promote much more trade and look at the big industries that they have the whole car industry is building on that they have such a a, a, a lower uh, Hello, Euro. Yeah, but why like do the, the, why why does Germany why is Germany in the position they are now, being the country that was affected the most during the war? Not not the most, but in a certain you know after losing the war, they lost so much you know human resources. They had to rebuild so many cities, and then they were affected you know by the 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 separation of. Uh, German know, the got a unique chance to start from zero after the war. They they were completely destroyed. This is yeah. a country where they could really restart from 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 nothing. Exactly. Unlike other countries, and you know. This this economic uh, centralization kind of you know, like this economic uh, union helped Germany become what it is. So, but this is we're talking about you know we're we're probably uh, you know like going off the topic. Um, this would be a, an interesting. So, uh, there's also one thing I, I want to add here. Uh, yeah. German economy, the German economy is actually very unique, and it's actually very cool, like how it works. Well, we should. Talk uh, the reason about why it. they're. I'll put it in the show notes and say and and mm, yeah, sure. and put it and say like we could the, talk about this one day whenever. Before, before we it. finish this topic, though, I want to ask Matthias. There's a word that I'm looking for, uh, but I can't, for the sake of me, remember the German word. Uh, the German economy is built out of like you know. But a lot of very small businesses. Uh, yeah, Klein- and uh, Unternehmen. Like it's like the Swiss one. Oh, okay. Okay. Like seventy-six percent of Swiss economy is built on uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies. Yeah. In, yeah, that's true. In, really... in, in Spanish, ish, in Spanish, it's uh, pymes. Also, you know, they, that's. Uh... But oh, okay. it, so it, it's actually an error to say that it's built on that. Because that they, they they are the one you know the biggest companies are the ones that are offering more employment at the same time they are too big to fail, so it's actually better for the economy to have big companies. In a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, actually, um, India is built not on problem. small on small and medium companies, and they they they're not doing so well. Whilst uh, Germany, China China you is know. you know based on big companies. And that's why they were doing quite much better. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but I, I also wanted to uh, throw out a question, you know, uh, relating to the topic that you actually you actually mentioned, Adam, very well, which is uh, how would England benefit from from this, you know, from the you know the the euro going down uh, because of uh, of uh, Greece. Uh, it's a it's a question for both of you guys if if you're ready to answer it. I think, I mean, in my opinion, it would I mean, be it's like a, yeah, it's like the reverse effect that's happening now with uh, with Brexit with the pound. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like they would be in a much better b bargaining position, right? You guys again, think? again, again, is it goes back to the example with the Swedish crown. If the euro would fail, it would be exactly the same. You know, yeah. they're they're winners and losers. If the euro would go down, e yeah. export the, and import. I mean, they're they're winners in the sense that, in, in terms of Brexit, they would go out with a better, with a better bargaining position. With a I wouldn't deal. even say so because like it it really depends now. This is really difficult to say. Now we have a discussion window for the Brexit. It's just started on nineteenth, so today. Yeah. But like, it all depends now because like if we recall in other sessions we said that. Uh, the EU even wants to make uh, England still pay, you know, for certain things. Yeah. So a default of Greece or a crash of the euro with a bad deal could have negative effects, obviously. But anyways, this is really like uh, based on a lot of hypothetical uh, assumptions. Well, it's interesting to, to, to understand this. Um, but... Um... I think we'll uh, we, 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 let's move on to the next topic then. Or do we have any conclusions? 
I mean, um, I think the best conclusion that we can, can give at the moment is that we're going to look at, into Greece uh, next session yeah. deeply and a bit more structured. So uh, you guys can get a, a clear overview on what is exactly happening. And maybe we can like find some solutions on, on how to um, tackle some of, some of the prevailing uh, challenges. Yeah. That sounds okay. good. Sounds good. I hope you guys are excited. So we wanted to talk about also esports. Uh, you know how the increasing popularity of of, uh, of people going to uh, see uh, what's going on in, in for you know in in these esports, especially the biggest ones are League of Legends and uh, maybe Dota as well. And yeah, also Dota, World of Warcraft. It depends which which uh, um, how do you say which which uh, segment we're looking at. Counter-Strike a, seems pretty popular as well, and Hearthstone. That is, exactly, yeah, exactly, as well. and Hearthstone. So, I mean, I these are the like most the biggest ones channels. right now are like Hearthstone, Counter-Strike, and League of Legends, followed by, you know, Dota and all those other ones. So, so which, exactly. are, which are the biggest? Those, those are the biggest then? Mo most viewed at the moment when you go on Twitch is probably League of Legends. Oh, wow. yeah, for sure, for yeah, sure. Followed that's... by Hearthstone, followed by CS, I think. Exactly. Exactly. I actually, I actually saw like, uh, um, like an idea that they were having of you know like setting up the, like a huge floor, with uh, the map of League of Legends and you know like little dots on, how how the the, the 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 like the little, the characters are moving or like the players are moving through the through the map and fighting and everything. Yeah, like, exactly. It was kind of like a, a vision, you know, that somebody had. Like, this would be so cool. And I, I, I think I, I would actually watch it, if, uh, if they had something like that. I would actually go there and and watch one day a, a match of it. I mean, you can already watch now matches. Um, they're Online, across. Yeah. Like, I think after football, we have to realize is that I think esports is like the second sports that have become completely global. If you if you get what I mean, it's yeah. really played around the entire globe. I mean, there are leagues yeah. in Brazil, in in Asia. It's gigantic. And if you speak about esports, you have to also speak about the esports capital of Korea. I yeah. mean, actually, esports has been promoted by the Korean government in hopes to build on their uh, sports facilities. Because as you guys might know, they're really good in Taekwondo, but the the government was looking for other also other areas that they could like promote the youngsters and uh, so Korea is like really the capital for esports and you also see it with the with the with the pro players like in Starcraft or League of Legends the best ones hmm. are mostly Korean yeah. yeah I'm actually proud to say that Sweden I would consider Sweden the second one even exactly. before the US which is intense yeah. in uh, in Spain we're actually having Hearthstone leagues like university leagues, which is actually quite interesting. Um, this is also really great. Yeah, exactly. Great yeah. point. Um, in in the US, uh, big big uh, the the Big Ten universities have uh, all agreed to also uh, start with uh, with uh, gaming course and like uh, to participate in leagues. So that's really impressive how how everything is taking such a turn. And I think a lot of people really underestimate the the size of this business and uh, I also like wanted to just quickly yeah, throw, throw in some, some numbers. numbers. <laughs> I mean, uh, Jinx. Huh? Yeah. So we spoke. About, <laughs> so we basically spoke about Amazon <laughs> bought Twitch in 2014 for 970 million in US dollars. That's really amazing, big price, for what was still something that was growing and not really known to many many people. Yeah, I guess I and guess they had like so, a really big business plan for it, like. As soon as they bought it, they already had the idea of uh, probably announcing their products through it and and making it like announcing it and make it it making it much easier for for streamers to to work through it and you know gain money through it. You know. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, uh, you also see like big football teams are already starting teams. You know, Manchester City or even more famous PSG. They're they're actually. Uh, Starting esports teams and which are competing. That's intense. I haven't the... heard about that. That was that's actually new to me. That's quite interesting. No, no, there's like no jokes. They have signed up whole squads of players 
in a number of different esports, like for example for League of Legends as well. That's pretty cool. So I mean, and if you if you guys remember, like last week uh, from the webpage Newzoo, we have like found out how how much money even League of Legends makes per month, uh, over a hundred million revenue per month. That's that's quite fantastic. And I mean, like one question you want to ask yourself will these 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 players ever reach uh, stardom like like uh, football players what yeah. do you guys think maybe just to give you some some information the the best player of league of legends and um, faker has on his contract already two million pounds per year without sponsorship that's huge i'm i'm actually so, so 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 guys what do you think will will this ever get to the same proportions like like we see in in with football probably i mean i guess it all depends on uh investors obviously um uh so maybe you know like as soon as huge companies start investing obviously we have amazon who's investing in this but as soon as you start getting coca-cola and all that they're probably going to make sure you know through their announcements you know through their ads that hey you know we're, we're investing we're the proud sponsor of this team of esports you know I'm I'm gonna say in the foreseeable future, no. Uh, there's no way that no somebody is gonna buy a player for like 500 million or you know like some crazy amount that we can see sometimes. In football. I think. But, well, I mean, the the most expensive deals are at the moment around 100 100 million pounds now for the uh, most I was players. thinking in Swedish crowns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that that's you know like still like 100 million. Exactly, like, yeah. I think wow. I think um, I think I think it will be more like um, kind of like leagues uh, from from each country. I think you know, like each country puts through puts in their leagues or each state or just, each you just know. Just put those numbers. Actually, like those numbers that, that you just said, Matthias, they actually yeah. were the same. So the, yeah, the sorry, revenue yeah. switch was one hundred million, right? Yeah. The biggest football football player purchase. Was 100 million. Yeah, I don't so think that this is, one this is a company player... buying another company. Actually, not like it's not. I, I wouldn't qualify it as as the same thing. I don't know, but you know, um, in in any... 30 years, 40 years maybe. But uh, I think I think so... in in around. I think even faster I, because I... like if you look, just look at the viewers for example. It's all kids. Um, at yeah. the moment, the, the the audience is like estimated approximately 400 million for this year of viewers yeah and made up out of approximately 200 regular viewers already so that's already a gigantic number i think why it wouldn't reach the same proportions yet is because a lot of streaming services are free and if you look at football football is everything over television for example if you look at premier league how much Guy sports, everyone pays to watch football. However, here with esports, majority of it is still free. Yeah, mm. yeah. So that's 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 maybe a big driver why it would never, or like in the near future, uh, would, would maybe uh, reach the same proportions. I think, or I think, you know, like uh, probably one day television or you know internet companies will buy the rights to to you know uh, showing these uh, these um, major leagues you know and i think that's probably an, an investment opportunity that com that companies or you know like uh, media companies are already envisioning especially because you know they're moving away from television and they're starting to try to move to to the internet so i think it it would be a a good opportunity that they're probably already envisioning and they're probably seeing how they could try and do it i don't know how do you what do you guys think no you're okay. right but i've i've read also in the new york times article actually that um in the united states league of legends has managed to work with the big 10 network of the universities and they've got into also tv channels now that would basically broadcast them so that's already a really big move into a direction where we could see similar proportions. So, yeah. what what do you guys think then? Should you think? Well, let's let's bet on it, and in ten years or 
20 years we can say hey, hey you know you were right or i was right i think i think in the next decade we'll see a huge increment of it or way too vague it's too vague i think no but i, I think the next decade like uh the 2020s I think we'll we'll see a huge increment, either that or it will stay, you know, in the Asian as an Asian, uh, you know, like yeah. a, a more Asian and maybe North American kind of uh, interest because uh, Latin Latin America and Europe are, you know, they're too big on on soccer and other kind of sports, you know, like more physical sports. Um, but as I said, you know, here in in Spain, uh, uh, here in Europe, it's uh, it's kind of like gaining some momentum. And as soon as it gets some worldwide, uh, you know, like interest, uh, huge companies will start mo making their move into it. Yeah, I mean, just just to give you an idea, so the Big Ten Network is like a sports um, television company that uh, reaches approximately 60 million households in the United States. And so I've just uh, updated myself. Um, League of Legends has agreed a deal with Big Ten Networks to show now selected games on a weekly basis on cable. So people can really legit watch it already on TV. Shit. That's 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 actually you see, well I think I think it may be even even closer. I mean, yeah. Five to ten years I think. I would give it with that with that information. However, let's let's see if obviously something it, this is obviously based on the fact that uh, something else doesn't appear like or they start making football with machines you know soccer played by machines or something like that <laughs> I mean like, never well, we can also like we can also take it from a different angle you know like if you look at how actually these gaming companies or like the game itself makes money it's quite quite interesting yeah. so League of Legends basically is based on a concept that you just buy they make their money with micro purchases, which is like you buy things for a very small amount. And I think we touched base on that last week, where you basically in the game, you can't buy like um, better weapons or whatever with money. But however, you can like pimp out your, your champion that it would look like would like look looks cooler. You can buy skins. And so they make make money off of that. And out of all these micro purchases, they they reached uh, as the first uh, PC game company over a revenue of one billion in as a as a free to play game. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. So they were the first ones to reach uh, over one billion revenue. So it's like really insane how out of all these small purchases, they actually make uh, so much money out of it. Reminds me a bit of IKEA with their set of live products. <laughs> actually, IKEA is reinventing themselves. Actually, I've seen a few. I've read in a few things, but uh, that's a topic for another day. So. So yeah, I think the gaming industry might, you know, overtake sport industry like within the century. But I don't think there's going to be a player purchase that is going to exceed like a football player purchase. Yeah, exactly. Well, I call, I, I agree. Like. Especially not in the next ten years, hmm. because the generation of of the viewers have have been growing up knowing that it's free, you know. So I don't know if uh, yeah yeah if if it if ever will reach this dimension. I mean, like if you really look at it, I mean the players are already earning millions right now, you know. Yeah. So yeah, let's see let's see how it develops. Um. Yeah, maybe it could be on public television you know like like you know uh, not non not cable tv but you know public television and just you know they through through ads and everything they companies can get their uh, or yeah. you know like the media but, companies uh, can get their revenue but, back channels or something but here here i really have to agree with adam that um, the generation that is watching right now is is still growing up so it really needs at least another and uh, the second generation that is following to make it really boom to a to a similar level if it ever would reach such a level well then everything there is now is patience that's all they need well this exactly. is uh this was very interesting uh do you guys have anything to add I, I i'm i'm sure i don't have anything to add uh i think that's it yeah okay well, we'll have more opportunities to talk about it in the future yeah exactly for sure exactly for sure that would be great
Can you guys tell me the difference between private equity and venture capital? Um, I actually can't. Venture capital is a type of private equity. Well, uh, so <clears throat> venture capital is a part of private equity. Yeah. And could you explain to me, yeah. like, you know, everything you know about private equity? Private equity yes. is the investment into small cap firms. Uh, it could be either those that are not public or just smaller ones that are not, you know, they're private companies. That's usually how it goes. But some so people it's not like do investment. It's not like investment into, you know, like the financial markets. It's directly putting money into a company. No, it can't be financial well, market. It depends on the business. It's just general whatever business it is. You can't. Mm. It can't be a financial, you know, investment in financial market if your business is in this. But venture capital is usually for startup companies or you know like new developments or something like that. No. That is correct. Yes. Yeah, and there's yeah. like five stages. And of the development, the yeah. entrepreneurial cycle. Yes. And I was actually reading, you know, like there is actually a uh, sixty percent risk that. There is that during the seed stage, there's nothing, and then 50, and then 40, and then 20, and then 10. You know, like when you're in yeah. the IPO stage, it's already like it's gonna happen for sure. Like, uh, unless something like really radical happens, or it was like some kind of Ponzi scheme, then then it you really like your Ponzi scheme. Yeah, uh, I thought it... <laughs> the same. <laughs> <laughs> when a, when a company goes to IPO stage. The probability that it fails is not that great, but it does happen quite a lot actually. And it's usually, you, do you guys know about the procedure like when you go from a private company to a public company, how it works? Uh, it, it goes through the IPO stage, no? Like initial public yeah, offering. But, yeah, but yeah, yeah. But, well, what happens? Like, well, they they like, like speculate on how. What do they hire? What? Who do they hire? Like, who does it for them? Like, what's the primary market? What's secondary market? Why did they do an IPO? You know, like all that sort of stuff. Hmm. Um. <laughs> so let me ask you this: Why does companies go public? Why do companies go public? Yeah, to raise much more money. Of course, to get investments. Yeah. Oh shit! Why do they per prefer to raise money like this without just borrowing money from the banks? Because they can, right? They don't need to, to yeah, go public. Um, well, I mean, I guess it's kind of more. Uh, they kind of owe less money, I guess. It's not about like look if it's they based just on, it's based get, on go to a the bank. Is, no? I know this doesn't matter, but like you can make much more money on a stock, and no no bank will come and say, "All right, guys, we'll give you a hundred milli without them being tight around your balls. Yeah, and this basically. also. And it's also uh, I mean, you it's have to just look, the shitty the investors, risk. you know, breaking your balls. Okay, so it's actually like, uh, yeah, Matthias is like, he's spot on. But there's one thing I would like to point out, and this is I, I've actually talked to an analyst about this because I said what Matthias said that they're going to be tight around your balls. <laughs> but I, I I said this in Swedish. But but he said to me is that uh, when you like you can make like an offer. I'm not sure like if an offer. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but when you make that public, kind of, uh, there's a lot of banks approaching you, and they kind of compete to be for you to be their customer. And when they compete, like it, we, like for a cu customer, like all the banks, you know, like JP Morgan or all the commercial banks, Santander, you know, all of these, mm -hmm. they you have a really like big drawback on the regulatory things. So it, it actually like they're not that tight around your balls as it, as you might think they would be because they actually compete over you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, this for <laughs> sure. But, but yeah, you're, you're also, completely right. You're completely right. The, the, this also happens with uh, with the stock market that they want to issue their stocks, and eh? they there's also really big competition on where they yeah. get listed. Then yeah, so there's a, 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 a second uh, stage to it. Yeah, so you you also have this drawback of going public where you have to really care about like your shareholders and what yeah, they Yeah, where think. you want to float your shares and blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but um and and I I wanted to ask you Adam like is there is there less investment during um is there less investment during the during summer or is there like stages uh, you know you know during the the different uh you know like times in the year so 
in general, you have this way of viewing the year as Q1 to Q4. You yeah. guys probably are familiar with that. So yeah. the investments, they circle, like they circulate or they regulate during these quarters. Um, some people think that winter is very heavy in investment because that's when people usually have, you know, like they're excited for the Q1 quarter reports. Yeah. Uh, so like December, uh, late December, Christmas time, January, like that's usually like a pretty intense time, but also summer. Uh, that's just, I have never read anything like purely about this, but I know that there's uh, as investment banks and asset management firms, business is very, very busy during January. That's what I've heard because then you have the, the, the Q1 reports. So, which are very important. So that's company. also a kind of way like to, in a sort of way that companies can also say, oh, well, you know, we made only the 22% that we said we made, that we said we were going to make, or 22% or 4% or whatever. Uh, but instead they made much more money. It's just that they, they invested it all into, I don't know, venture capital or into markets or whatever, maybe. Mm-hmm. Or they probably... Yeah, so- uh, <clears throat> Or, or they probably, I was also reading about, you know, like, uh, actually a lot of uh, companies are investing less in R&D nowadays and okay. putting all the money from the R&D into, into buying their own stocks so that they can make the price go higher. Okay, so can I ask you guys then, like, well, I'm the viewers, um, <clears throat> why does a company care about what their stock price is? Do you guys um, have any idea why? Because why do they, they care? Money. They already did the IPO. They get, no, they get they more money. They already did the IPO. Why, why, how get, do they get more money? Well, I mean, um, if uh, I mean, if they, if the companies, you know, podcast, uh, podcast, <laughs> uh, if the companies um, like um, share costs goes high, becomes higher, then it means that the they get more money from from every share no it's like the more money from yeah, investments but, no the, the shareholders get more money or they get yeah. more money when they sell the share yeah exactly but so from when the share is bought then the company gets money from the more money from these shares when they're bought yeah obviously. But, okay so so when when a when when a firm goes public they approach an investment bank and they make an offer in the primary market uh, and they use they use the investment bank as a medium to you know like put a first price on their first stocks, and they usually liquidate most of the most of the stocks at the beginning, and then <clears throat> the investment banks sell these shares in the in the secondary market. So the biggest cash inflow actually comes from the first IPO, and then it doesn't really matter because they've already raised all this cash. The, the cash is already raised and the stocks are already out there. And it actually doesn't matter to them if the stock price increases by 20% unless they issue more shares, hmm. right? Because if, if yeah, you know what I mean, right? So yeah, yeah. if you hold shares and they increase, yeah, it's good for you because you, you might want to sell them, but for Apple, it doesn't really matter to them. But what does matter though, and the reason why many companies care about this is because you have options, like domestic options within the company. So the CEOs and all the officers, the CFO, the CEO, you know, the COO, all these all these people and all the all the employees, they they most likely have options that they can utilize later on. So this works as an incentive to make their options more, more valuable later. That's why they care so much so much about the stock price. Uh-huh. So it's kind of like, in a way, it's a kind of like evaluation, like a, a performance evaluation for directives, no, and associates and everything, no, of a company. Yeah. So because exactly. you know you, you so can't you it, can't just give them more money. You have to make them work to make to make you know the shares more valuable for them to you know exactly. get more money. And I guess yeah. they, that's when they start giving out dividends, right? Yeah, also, also. Like, uh, when, you know, like the dividends, they do have a correlation with the stock price, obviously. Yeah. But they're not immediately, like, tied. Uh, dividends come from retained earnings. If you guys know your, you know your financial statements, when, mm-hmm. you know, like, they have enough money, they just, they might just give some to, to the shareholders as, you know, like, thank you for, 
you know. Only. Yeah, for giving the trust exactly. Mm. Yeah, so the option the option thing is actually very interesting how how that works. Um, you guys know about options as well, right? Maybe yeah. we can. Yeah, but but you can explain it. <laughs> my dad uh, buys all the time options. Yeah, mine too. Oh, that means that he's a pretty sophisticated investor, and I'm like, usually you don't really have private investors, you know, going crazy with options. No, no, he, he does. I told you, like, he's he's doing every day. He's like morning, evening. Okay. Have you done it? He, he's bored, and so he just buys options. You know. it's but it's, thing you know, like. <laughs> okay, so have you that? Have you that ever told you about paying premium when he buys the the options? Have you ever told you anything about how it works? Yeah, but uh, I forgot. Okay, so, so are you guys familiar me. with derivatives? Derivative. Explain, okay, so, it, explain it all. Uh, I'll explain it. And I'm going to use an example. Okay, so there's many forms of options. Uh, and let's say that Alonso, he has a company in Spain. And he imports... Um, <clears throat> Alonso imports from the US. So everything he sells... Come, actually comes from the US and he resells it in the domestic market, which in this case is Spain. So when Alonso imports something, he needs to use the domestic currency, the euro, to exchange it for US dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when the euro increases in value, then that's very good for Alonso because he imports. But if it decreases in value, then that's very bad. So <clears throat> let's say that Alonso makes a deal with the U.S. exporter, and they say that in 30 days Alonso has to pay 1 million euros to this company. Then Alonso is very concerned about the volatility in the exchange rate, because if the euro, as I said before, increases, then his purchases can become much cheaper. But if it increases, let's say that the whole the euro collapses, then he defaults most likely on his purchase and his business goes down so how can he how can he protect himself against this risk yeah, well deriv derivatives of course <laughs> yeah he buys derivatives so he he can make he can pay a premium to to buy us dollars in 30 days for the same price as the present value and it's exactly the same thing for stocks exactly the same thing it works exactly the same way yeah. Hello. So yeah, you have yeah, yeah. So you you have options. You have something called call options, where you can <clears throat> buy put, something. Call and put, right? Yeah, yeah. Put is sell and call is buy. Oh. So yeah, like it it just works like this. And then you have like long straddle. Like you have all these weird way of using options to you know like hedge your risk. So that's why I'm very interested in, like your dad, like he does this, like by himself, because usually only very big businesses do this. But I no, think he he, he, he's he does help. it with, huh? Yeah. No, no, of course. As I said, he's he's in morning and evening always with a banker, you know. Yeah. In contact, and he does this, you know, like passionately. Mm. So obviously, uh, without the help of a professional banker, uh, impossible. Yeah. So, then uh, this is an impossible, but yeah, it's and you know like no, no, not, not impossible, but you know with without the uh, system knowledge and uh, access to softwares and data, no. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like when when your 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 dad talks about this next time, you got maybe you guys can talk a bit about it about it, like what he thinks and stuff like that, because it's very interesting. Like no, I would no, love super to like that, like he was going crazy with the options like that's really cool actually yeah we can uh, put you guys in contact otherwise <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah let's make a let's make a conference I want to start uh, me and your dad good stuff I would be so funny <laughs> be so would just funny. be weird yeah <laughs> <laughs> what would they end up talking about um, something not about options I think <laughs> just something else well, I don't think they want to discuss this, but, you know, like in general. But yeah, 
Well, that was actually um, a very interesting crash course there, Adam. And I, I was, I, I was actually, you know, it's kind of, it's really interesting because all this, you know, you always think, oh well, financial markets is just stocks, you know, like uh, buying and selling and everything. But uh, then uh, you got, you got like all these derivatives, and then also, you know, like stock options and you know, venture I capital invested, the- private equity. Oh, what's sorry? Derivatives is like the market for derivatives is, is actually much much greater than the stock market itself. Yeah. Uh, because and why is there like so they're just much? Bet. They're just best bets pla- placed on stocks, so that's why they're mm-hmm. worth so much more, like three times more or something like that. But don't quote me on that. Yeah, but is it like much riskier to invest in, ec- yeah, in derivatives? Yeah. Um, it depends. Uh, on it, options, derivatives. Really, really depends. So I think that you know call options and put options are they're kind of hedgers. It's you make the investment much less risky, hmm. but you got to make sure that you cover both ways. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I think the derivatives first and like many derivatives actually work as you know reducing risk, but you have to pay premium on it. So it reduces your your risk of like you know massive loss, but it can create you know like so it's smaller like, loss. So it's like paying you know like kind of an insurance, but not but you know it's just yeah, yeah. okay if nothing yeah, happens absolutely. then that's good, but you know you're wasting money on insurance. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. you're completely right. It's interesting. Thank you, Adam, for this explanation. And so then, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> When is no, 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 no. So, anyways, thank you for listening, and you will be able to read about everything we talked in the description down below. Also, consider subscribing to listen to the show the day it comes out. So, lately it's been coming out at different days, so it would be a great idea to, to subscribe. <laughs> anyways, thank you, and bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Holy shit, fuck, I just got a very big... Oh my god, this is actually like a big one. <laughs> what? Really? Oh no, no, did it release? <laughs> fuck! <laughs> fuck, that was huge, man. <laughs> this is this is going to be introduced out of context <laughs> in the show. Thank you, Adam. <laughs>